Hey, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, today is the day we get to highlight the Mary and Jean Ford Center for Media and Literacy. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we've spent some time getting together this presentation to really highlight some thing in the Borg Center, um, to let you know where the Borg Center is, um, <clears throat> the structure of the Borg Center, and, and all of that great stuff. So this is the entrance of the Borg Center. We are in the Garmo on the third floor. Um, most people know Studio Teach, so when you come off the elevators facing Studio Teach, just take a hard right when you get to the um, hallway, and we're right you're right there, can't miss us. Um, a little bit about the history of the Borg Center, at least the history that I know. Um, the Center for Reading and Literacy was established by the Illinois Board of Higher Education in 2001. Um, in 2008, Ms. Jean Borg endowed the Center for Reading and Literacy, which was then renamed the Mary and Jean Borg Center for Reading and Literacy in honor of her gift. So the Borg Center is a college of education center, which is housed in the School of Teaching and Learning. The mission of the Borg Center um, from its inception exists to promote the effective use of language in our community, speaking very broadly, we define community broadly, um, to include only not so the Bloomington Normal, the regional communities, and the state of Illinois, and some of our programs have gone even beyond the state, um, particularly during COVID when we did a lot of things online. <clears throat> um, the Center for Reading and Literacy has a research and service as its area of focus. So services will be provided to educators, children, families, um, and workers in the larger community. Research is conducted by faculty at the School of Teaching and Learning, and then collaborators from other departments sometimes, uh, with target audiences of the professional education community. So uh, we want to inform uh, our community about research on literacy and literacy education. So the goals of the Borg Center, there are four main goals, and each of those goals has sub-goals. Um, so the four main goals are to provide services to policymakers in the area of reading and literacy, provide services to the state of Illinois um, in, in reading and literacy, provide service to professional educators, um, and then support research among university faculty and members of the wider research community, uh, which will broaden understandings of reading literacy and literacy education. Um, so, just a bit of a uh, word about the administrative structure of the center. We are a college center, so the dean of the college obviously is at the top of this hierarchy here. Um, the director and support staff in TCH is um, who supports the work of the center. Um, the board center director, me, <laughs> is a faculty member with a reduced teaching load, so we don't actually have a full-time director like most centers in the college. Um, I am the director of the center and I work um, in that capacity on a reduced teaching load. Uh, we also have graduate assistants who manage the materials in the center, which I'll talk a bit about in just a minute. Um, and they support research happening at church. And then faculty colleagues. We have a faculty advisory committee um, for the Borg Center and faculty often work on research and special, special projects. And again, I'll share some of those. So the bulk of this presentation is to talk a little bit about the services we provide in the research center. So we're gonna get right on to that. Um, since we can definitely be informal. So if, as I'm explaining this, you have any questions about how anything works, please feel free to make this a little more conversational. So I'm not just sticking up here, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. All right, so services. We provide services to ISU students and faculty, to Illinois educators, and to the community more. Resource Center, again, it's on the third floor. Um, and it's basically books and tech sets um, that students can check out. through a self-checkout system, so it's not, um, it's not connected to Milner Library at all. It's its own kind of self-checkout system. Um, and we, just a couple of years ago, right at the time of COVID, did a fundraiser for that, and we got a ton more um, 
texts to add to that collection. We're currently adding bilingual texts and translanguaging texts to that collection too. Um, so students can come in anytime that we're open and they can, once they're entered into our system, which gift, gift, wave at the crowd. <laughs> gift manages that. She barcodes all of the books um, and she keeps them all nice and neat and tidy. And we try to make it as easy as possible for students to use so they can actually, once they're entered into the system, they can come in and check out. They can use the little scanner. They love it. It's fun, right? Choose their books. They can check out themselves, and then they just drop them on a shelf, and gift rechecks them in and shelves them. Yeah. How do students find out about the book resource? Usually seven? from their instructors. Okay. Mostly their instructors tell them about it, um, particularly 209 instructors, because the um, our teacher candidates in 209 are working one-on-one -on -one with students out in the field. Okay. I was just wondering if maybe we could do like some social media pieces. Um, we're really growing our content on Instagram and just thought maybe we could do something with some of the, the content. Yeah, that would be awesome. Because usually when juniors start coming in, they're like, we didn't even know about yeah. that. I think a lot of educators would be excited about that. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the resource center. Uh, we provide services to faculty on campus, particularly our big, our big initiative in that regard is each semester since the fall of 2019, we have offered uh, a learning sequence for NPT faculty in TCH. And so here are some of the titles of those. Um, so those are a little bit, they're a long-term professional development over the semester. So there's usually a three hour, a workshop at the beginning and then three follow-up meetings throughout the semester so that um, a faculty member can support non-tenure line faculty with developing what they learned in that workshop in their classes across the semester. Um, so we've had them on just generally teaching in higher education. Dr. Kloss did that for us. Uh, reading and using research and literacy instruction and assessment, promoting equity-based MTSS with teacher candidates. Um, equity and diversity and pre service teacher education, um, just teaching innovations. Like Allison Meyer did a session for us to um, where faculty, non tenure line faculty, actually did some um, kind of action research in, in one of their classes. And then using young adult literature to create LGBTQ plus inclusive instruction with Dr. Peter and Hansfield. And then just this semester, Dr. Seglum did one with restorative teaching. So great topics, very timely and relevant. Um, and our entities are responding very positively to these courses. courses. Uh, we also provide professional learning for educators um, who are out teaching in the field through, and we've done workshops. We've done short courses that are longer than workshops, but um, not like a full-on course. Um, during COVID, we did the Redbird Educator Series, and those um, presentations can still be found on our website. And then we also will do longer-term school-based professional development. We've done that with four or five districts um, close by. Um, this is probably the thing that I pay the most attention to. We offer a reading assessment service and a tutoring service at the board center. So we're working with children in the community. Um, Monday through Thursday, we have tutoring after school hours. And you can see just, there's, I just put a little bit of data on here that our program is growing each year. <laughs> so when we first started, we served... Um, the first academic year, we served seven children. And this is all by word of mouth. I haven't done a lot of publicizing, mostly because our physical space is so small. Um, we're currently tutoring in nooks and crannies all over the, all over the board center because we are up to, um, last year we saw 35 students. Um, and this year we're up to 31 and we still have a summer program to do in this academic. So we run a 12-week tutoring program in the fall and the spring, and then a six-week tutoring program in the summer. Yes? The students typically do? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> and so we're, we're yes. Um, 
we hired our first student to tutor um, this semester. Previously, it has been me doing the tutoring because this is very tied to the research agenda in the Borg Center. Um, and then an NTT, who's a reading specialist, Michelle Martinez, does some tutoring for the center. Um, and Wanda, graduate student, will be doing some tutoring in the spring. We are in the process of developing a training program um, for students. This is a, a research-based tutoring program, so I, I'm very getting, we're making sure that students are getting the best instruction, evidence-based instruction that they need. So I, I have been reluctant for undergrads to be tutors without a very consistent, robust training program for them. So we're in the process of developing that now. Um, and right now we're looking at doing it as almost like an independent study course where there are modules and that they have some observation hours in the, in the reading or in the tutoring program. Um, and then once they've been through that, then they can apply to, to in progress. <laughs> but I've been doing a lot of the tutoring myself and with a few certified in different programs that we use. Tutoring um, like designed differently for each student or do you just have like one program you use? Is it like individual? Yes, it is. We do some assessments and then uh, yes, we plan instruction based on the needs of each individual learner. Okay. It's also a uh, be a service for a fee. So we're always looking for grant money, but right now it is a fee service. So um, families do pay for their children to come, although we do a much lower price <laughs> than like a Sylvan or a place where they would go out in the community to get tutoring. So yeah, we do it as low as we can and actually run the program. <laughs> Okay, so a little bit about the research that's happening in the center. Um, we have an eye movement MISQ analysis lab in the center. So, so through our tutoring program is usually how we get um, students involved in this research. So we can, we have equipment to measure children's eye movements as they're reading so that we can learn about eye movements are kind of as direct uh, route to the, what's happening in the brain of a reader. Um, as anything. And so the eye movements tell us a lot about what's happening with a reader cognitively um, as they are. So students who come to tutoring are usually experiencing some sort of difficulty learning to read. And so um, if families agree, then we have the opportunity to eye track them pre-tutoring and post-tutoring. Back on the actual cognitive processing of text as they read. So um, it's it's a big work in progress because the equipment is very sensitive. It can take up to 2,000 images of an eye per second. So when you use this equipment, you are inundated with data. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, it's a very complex process and there's a whole, like, it works really better with adults because Part of it, you can see she's got her little the equipment comes with a chin rest in an attempt to um, keep little heads still because if they're moving around, then it's hard to, for the computer to get a reading. So little kids move around. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Tracking young children. Um, I now have this contraption that I built because. It's, a chin rest is a weird thing to keep a head still for reading because your your mouth is moving. So the chin rest is actually kind of causing the head to bounce a little. So I have this now um, PVC pipe contraption where they can just rest their forehead on it. And so that seems to be working a little bit better. <laughs> but it's fascinating to see the data. Um, People think that our eyes just move from left to right on text, but really uh, we look at 
saccades, and so those are eye movements, and um, fixations, which is where our eyes stop on text. And upwards of, for proficient readers, 15% of their saccades are actually backwards. So we're constantly, when we're reading, we're moving forward and back to check things. And, and our fixations, because physiologically, an eye can only see up to like 10 or 11 characters on a page. We, our brains predict a lot of what is coming. And so then if, if what we predict was inaccurate, then our eyes move back to collect some additional information. Wow. And so some words we don't even fixate on when we're reading, like mostly um, function words, like the ands and the these and the a's and the of's because we because of what we know about the structure of language we can predict those words more easily and so our eyes typically focus more on the content-based words in a text so it's really interesting to look at what eye tracking looks like with a proficient reader versus a novice reader or a struggling reader mm -hmm. yeah um, so we also do research on our tutoring, and since COVID, so when COVID happened, we research stopped because it was everything we could do to shift from our face-to-face -face tutoring to online tutoring, um, which was a, a pretty big challenge. Um, but we did do online tutoring for the for the semesters that we were here on campus, but got right back to on site as soon as we could. <laughs> Um, and so we're kind of re-envisioning the research now, and Wanda Turk, who is one of our doctoral students and graduate assistants, is um, So again, we see students every Monday through Thursday in the center, and we see students across a wide range of grade levels um, for a wide range of purposes, um, and that's and we're building that. We're continuing to build that program. Such a good we have what we let me just give credit where credit is due. Wanda has done a literature review this semester as part of her um, independent study work that she's doing with me to look at research that is happening out of reading clinics in universities. And so one thing that we found is that in most reading clinics and universities, the focus is on the pre-service teacher development. Um, in our center, we're really focused on the development of the child. <laughs> and we are in the process of getting our, um, teacher candidates involved in that. But um, yeah, we are we do want to collect data on the development of the child as well as the pre-service teacher and collect perspectives from parents about the program and those kinds of things so that we can um, have a process for continuously improving the product degree. Um, so another research project that's going on on the Borg Center is a partnership with Pontiac and Dr. Courtney Hatton is the PI on that project and I'm, I'm working on that with her and we are in our third year of that partnership. So we started in 2021 with COVID year for, with an observation study. So that those observations ended up being done through virtually through Zoom and through so really, you know, we couldn't just not start the partnership once we had an agreement and everything. So we just had to um, make do. And then in 2021-2022, we um, started a second project supporting evidence-based literacy practices with first grade teachers. So we, after the observation study, um, and we were contacted by Pontiac, by the curriculum person of Pontiac, and invited to develop this partnership. So we were really excited about that. Um, and so we worked through this curriculum person to have the observation study. And the paper, first paper from this project is literally Courtney is not here right now because she's finalizing that paper for submission. <laughs> so hopefully next year there'll be our first paper from this one. Um, so now we, in 2021-2022, we spent some time doing some professional development with Pontiac teachers around developing um, content-based units of study and supporting knowledge building and vocabulary development 
Um, we have some really positive data from that. So we had a um, <coughs> experimental group and a control group, and we had positive data. The experimental group um, outperformed the control group in um, two of um, our assessments that we did. So, um, so this year we've moved up to second grade. So we're doing. So each year we improve upon the professional development that we're providing. Um, and so this year we're working with second graders. Your daughter's yeah. part of this study this year. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and so we are in the professional development phase and in January, February, they will teach their six week unit and we'll collect additional data. And then next year the partnership will move up to third grade. Um, and so it's been a really nice relationship with the school district. And so we are actually looking to do more of this. Um, so you're kind of following the same group of students. As yes, yeah. So these are the same group. Yes, but they're not, I don't think they're, I don't think we've, we're not following them in the sense that the same students are not in the experimental group in the control group because they got all mixed up when they moved to new classrooms for second grade. <laughs> so, so we are collecting data on the same students, uh, but we're looking at them as classes. So it's it's not like a longitudinal study in that way. Yeah. <laughs> Please join the research team. How they look with the, the students that were in the control groups, the, the test study last year in the first year. Yeah, because we can certainly back you can still yeah. sort yeah. the data yes. that way. Yeah. We can still sort yeah. the data that way. Yeah. So we hope that um, this reciprocity, like we're providing professional development and they're providing students and teachers to do research. And we hope that the teachers are learning from, you know, from this process. Um, but it's been a really good, and research is historically hard to do in schools, right? Because there are like so many <laughs> things you can't control. Like we have substitutes are, so part of our agreement is that um, the school districts provide substitutes for the teachers on the days that we do professional development. And it, we've had to reschedule several, <laughs> several professional development days because there just aren't any subs around mm -hmm. the classes. So it's it's been challenging in some ways, but so wonderful and rewarding in other ways. And I wish Courtney were here to talk about it. She's she's the lead person on the study, but this is the work that we feel like the Wolf Center should be doing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so we also have uh, children's <laughs> beliefs about reading study happening. Um, this study was good and the um, <clears throat> so I really want to understand um, what children believe reading is because reading what they believe reading is will influence what they do around reading. And over the past, gosh, probably eight or 10 years now, lots of things has cha have changed in schools and students have been subject to lots of different assessments, particularly fluency assessments where they're asked to read for one minute as fast as they can, essentially. Um, and when I am out in schools, I see kids who, from what I can tell, think that that's what reading is. <laughs> say all the words right and say them as fast as you can. Um, and so I just always had this, I really wonder what kids believe reading is and how that, like I worked in Pekin professional development schools for some time and we had a master's cohort there. And the teachers there would tell me that their students would um, come up to the computer to do their one minute reading and they would do this. <gasps> Oh and then the timer God. would start, and then they would say as many words as they could as fast as they could. And like they got, they, kids are, I know. 
Kids are smart though, and they have strategies, right? So they've got the idea that they were scored based on how many words they got right in a minute. So if they didn't know a word, they just skipped it and went with it. And so very little comprehension of what they were reading, but they were behaving in such a way that reflected an understanding of, to do well on this, I have to say as many words as I can fast. And that's not really the message that we want to send kids about reading. Um, I don't think any teacher intends to send that message, but it is maybe a byproduct of what we're doing in schools now. Anyway, so the idea was to create a survey where we could measure how what students believe about reading, just to see how that looks compared to um, different developmental milestones that um, have been rise to happen in reading. So before COVID, we, and then COVID hit and we couldn't get in schools to actually collect the data. But now we're collecting the data and I'm working on two graduate students who are in their uh, reading master's program and they are in their final year where they do an action research study and they have come on to this study. And so we're collecting data at Metcalf and in Leroy um, in the spring. Well, they started uh, interviewing teachers because we added a teacher component to it. Um, so while we're seeing what children believe about what reading is, let's see what teachers think reading is too. So they've done interviews this fall and we'll be collecting the survey data in the spring um, and beginning that analysis process. Um, so we also, in the past, this is published, it's out now, um, we did a study on the status of phonics instruction where we surveyed teachers from all across Illinois. Um, I you know if you're not in literacy, you probably don't think a lot about the reading wars and what's happening in politics and media, um, but this study was in response to some of what's being um, set out in the media about how children learn to read and how teachers teach children to read. Um, so Dr. Sandin, who is no longer with us, but uh, Washington, and myself, and then two, Stephen and Caleb are both graduate students. So we are doing our due diligence to get our graduate students involved in the research that's happening in the Forbes Center. Um, so here we wrote all about um, teachers uh, what teachers say. So kind of let's hear from the teachers on this, right? Media is out there saying this and everybody is talking about teachers. So our perspective was let's talk to teachers and see what they are thinking and what they what their perspectives are on phonics instruction. All right, so now those are the biggest research things going on. I wanna talk a little bit about special projects before we close for the day. Um, so we have a few things going on now in the way of special projects, and these are uh, mostly inspired by our advisory committee of faculty. Um, so this semester, um, thanks to Dr. Sonia Klein, who works with our 260 clinical, and we use a textbook. We got this by Cornelius Minor, and Dr. Klein happens to have a relationship with Cornelius Minor, so she invited him to come speak to our um, mentor teachers out in the field and to our teacher candidates. And so there was a really nice event um, early in November where he did a Zoom call with what about 150. Um, and it was just nice because it brought together a lot of our, um, a lot of the people who support the work of the teacher candidates out in the field. The TCH purchased the book for. Um, mentor teachers, and then the Borg Center supported the presentation by Cornelius Minor, who then did a video with Dr. Klein afterwards that will eventually be up on the Borg website. So there will be a public facing um, talk or interview with him that anyone who comes to our website will be able to enjoy. Again, I wish Sonia were here and tell a little bit more about this. She worked tirelessly to get this, to make this happen. Um, and I think it was a great success. 
So another project that um, Dr. Hansfield has kind of initiated for us this semester is this text set pro project. So we have all of these texts that um, our students can um, check out, but we want to get them organized. And so Dr. Hansfield, do you want to chat a bit about your idea? And Sure. Yeah, to... so this is actually across our Teach 208 sections, and that is the first for all elementary majors, elementary ed majors, it's the first of three literacy methods courses. So in all of them, all of the teacher candidates put together a text set of children's literature and other kinds of texts, perhaps film, videos, you know, that sort of thing. Um, around a theme or something like that. And so what um, I had done with my teacher candidates, I work with bilingual majors. Um, and so they all put together their text set and then um, they have sort of, as you see on the screen, these visuals that go along with them um, that sort of um, contextualize them according to Dr. Goldie Muhammad's work around cultivating genius, which has uh, for literacy instruction, which has elements of teaching skills, teaching, um, engaging identity, intellect, criticality, and joy. And so teacher candidates then thought about how they can use these texts instructionally to promote these five elements of literacy instruction. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is one artifact in someone's text set and for high quality text sets, um, there, these are then going to be published correct, on the Borg Center website and printed out and on display for teacher candidates to see. And one of the reasons behind this is oftentimes teacher candidates will come in and with the idea that, oh, you know, I need to find a text at the right level for my student, and there's sort of this matching of levels. Uh, and texts and children in texts. And this was meant to really sort of showcase a more expansive understanding of how we might select texts and use them instructionally uh, with children. Gloria, the inspiration <laughs> for this was to set something up so that our candidates could submit their work yes. for review and then be published on the website yes. or published in the World Center as something that they might put on a resume or you know, something that they have out in the world that they developed and created that um, you know, might support them in a job search or. Our teacher candidates are creating a lot of content mm -hmm. and this is a way where they can actually get recognized for that as well, so yeah. They're doing great work. Yeah. Uh, two amazing tech centers. And so we're going to make sure that we have the texts in the board center and that um, we're going to find some of the board center with QR codes where people can click into them and get to their websites where there's lots of other information around the unit study. Can you explain what a text set is? I mean, I think I might know, but I'm not a teacher. So what is a text yeah, so set? So a text set is a group of texts, and we usually use the term text broadly. So as Laura said, it might be a book, but it might be a website, or it might be a uh, YouTube video. You need to be a museum display. A yeah. map, or a piece a of art, game. or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, around a specific topic. So this particular one is around immigration. And so the topic is usually related to some content area, science then, or math. Or, okay, so then another te another teacher candidate could then come in and use that as a resource that they could incorporate yes. into a lesson plan then? Yes, a cool. teacher in the field. So yeah. we hope to get these out on our website too, so that- And use them um, within a unit use. on immigration, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I love that. I wanna write a story about that too. So maybe once you get these up on the website or we get this up on the website, then we can do a story about all of that. And, yeah, and they also okay. conducted analysis, uh, complexity analyses of two of these texts through the text in the set. So, sort of multiple elements, as well as you know, you know, overviews of each text, how it contributes to the theme, and instructional possibilities. Mm -hmm. And it also highlights some of the important work our teacher candidates yes. do that often just gets submitted to a professor and gets right. graded but is really great work that could be used by a broader audience. And so, um, so in a way to show off the work of our teacher candidates. So one of the things that we're doing 
place in the spring, but. We're looking at doing a showcase of student work. We would have the opportunity if they have a project or a portfolio that is just going beyond what was expected. And they'd like to show that off for others and students who have an opportunity potentially. This, what they're creating with this with the tech step project could definitely be some things that would be added in. Right, because last spring a this person just submitted this fantastic project and I except for a giver a great grade and then she's going to pay a plus plus right? <laughs> and we need to show show these off. And are we linking it to recruitment events as well? So that those students. Yeah, because I've looked into a meeting too. So. Yeah. Yes. Because I'm going to be part of that. Yes. Center. Yes. And, and what great things to show for some exactly. students, too. I love that. Exactly. So, so if we can go and have it in some, in, I would like to see both formats. So that we students, other teachers can see what other people are doing. About the text that again that both of you brought up a little bit, and I think important for um, people to know about teachers and teacher um, candidates is um, really important. What Laura said about going beyond your your grade level of reading level. Um, novice teachers think if they're teaching fifth graders, they use fifth grade text, and sixth, and there are authentic academic purposes for using text above and below. And this models ways that teachers can do that. You can bring a picture book into an eighth grade classroom. And bring a chapter book into a first grade classroom. There are ways to do that and reasons to do that that are authentic that novice teachers or teacher candidates have not yet learned. So it's a really great opportunity for them to see all of the ways that can be supplied. So we are very excited about this project and how it's turning out. And part of the work of the Borg Center Committee now is going to be to develop a process for submission um, so that it's like not an award exactly, but that there's yes, that there's some sort of recognition. You know, that when you do high quality work, there's there's a benefit to that. Um, and so the upcoming project that we have going on, and this was inspired by Dr. Aaron Quast, is a what is literacy video series. So before I mentioned, if you're not in literacy, you might not know what's going on politically right now, but there's a lot of critique on higher ed and how we teach teacher candidates to teach children to read. Um, so we want to come out on the proactive side of that. And so we're working on a video series where, um, and this is really tightly tied to our first literacy course, Teach 208, and Dr. Erin Quast is the point person for that course. Um, and she wanted something to introduce each of the four major units in that course. And so she <laughs> had this inspired idea to have faculty respond on video to questions about literacy and then have the video um, edited and put together to um, to use in her class, but also then to put on the Wolf Center website so that people who want to understand what literacy faculty at ISU believe about how to teach reading and literacy, they can access that information on the board site. So we have five questions in January. Um, let's see, he's going to come over for two days and video faculty responding. All faculty don't have to respond to all of the questions, but 
they can choose the questions for which they have the most expertise. And um, hopefully by middle of spring semester, we'll have five video responses to these five questions um, that highlight faculty sharing their knowledge or their ideas. So that's also very exciting. Mm -hmm. And we're just trying now to figure out where should we do these videos and what should the background be? And <laughs> all the things I know absolutely nothing about. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're trying to um, have more public facing things coming out of the Borg Center um, so that we can become more well-known in the community and within our own institution. So, all right, so finally, and then, we have, we have a few minutes after this, and I can show you the whole website of the, there's a link to the website, there's the link out of it, and this is of the Zoom thing, of the um, immigration tech set. So oh, we can take a look at that. But um, this semester, Laura had some, sorry, Dr. Hansfield, had some students who wanted to do an honors project. And so Laura's like, I don't really know what to do. And they always did do these honors projects. And again, they do these projects and they just turn them into their professors and they don't really have a you know a audience beyond the professor that they're doing it for. So Laura said, hey, is there something they could do for around the Borg Center? You know, and so her two of her students did this honors project where they created a video. For two students from Dr. Hansfield bilingual 208-209 cohort who spent some time interviewing faculty and taking video and they created this video. Which their is, names are Lila Prochotsky and Christabel Chris Thomas. Yeah. I thought wonderful, very professional video. My name is Dr. Deborah McVie, and I am currently the director of the Board Center for Reading and Literacy. We offer many different services at the center. We maintain a children's book library for our students and faculty to use in their classes and clinical work. We offer children in the community. that eyes move progressively from left to right on text. But they really do a lot of, there's a lot more back and forth movement than people think. So for a proficient reader, um, about percent of their saccades, which is so interesting. Oh, what's short vowel? And to the sound of we offer professional development services. We occasionally bring in national speakers. For example, this semester we are inviting for you this minor. Um, we we're super excited about that. My name is Lara Hansfield, and I am a professor of elementary literacy and bilingual education. And I have the great pleasure of having my office be vested within the Borg Center for Reading Literacy. I engage my friend or two. One of them is through professional development. I've attended those and I've also participated in, in offering one. My regular use of the board center is um, really engaging with the language library. 
one of my favorite things to do is when I'm sitting in my office doing some work and there are future candidates using the Latin library, I like to engage with them in thinking about how they're selecting texts for the placements. Children's literature is actually one of my areas of research, and so I have very big feelings about diverse texts and how important those are. Um, so I actually was really lucky to get to work with Work Center on their Hatch project, raise funds to increase some of our collection of diverse texts in Work Center. I worked with Dr. Big Fee um, on the Hatch project that we compiled a list of texts that were really focused on issues of diversity, equity, and social justice, also so that students could really see themselves in the text. And so we um, ensured that the works of the author were text. So that our teacher candidates in the future, when they develop their classroom libraries, they also will have them in mind. One of the things that the center has been trying to do um, has been to increase the number of texts that we have that are in languages other than English or that are bilingual texts. And I'm thinking in particular a translanguaging text where the languages are actually meshed together. And so that's something that I'm really excited about. I think that that's part of offering a wider array of text that serve as mirrors and windows for our teaching candidates. I want to share one of my favorite texts from the center. And I'm going to share one of them that is a translanguaging text. And this is called The Land of the Cranes. And it's written by Aida Salazar. This is told from the first person perspective of a girl who, whose family is trying to deal with living across borders as well as deportation. It's very relevant. I would like to encourage teacher candidates to use the materials in the center and to explore them. I think the Borg Center is such a good resource that I feel like not very many people are talking about all the time because it's kind of on the third floor, so not everyone is having classes up here. Um, it's so nice to have it up 